everyone, I'm Sam and welcome to episode 5 of my podcast, The Sugarly Stitch. Hi everyone, so as I said, I'm Sam and this is my channel where I talk about all things knitting, spinning, and fiber craft related. Today is just going to be a normal podcast episode. I've got a few finished objects multiple works in progress as always, um, a few spinning projects, and last but not least, a giveaway winner to announce at the end. So hopefully you stay tuned for that. As always, I will have Ravelry links for all my projects linked below. If Ravelry isn't accessible to you, you can contact me and I can give you the details of anything that you want to know. I hope you have something fun to work on while you watch. I know I tend to put podcasts on kind of in the background or to keep me company as I'm working on knitting or spinning projects. So hopefully this serves the same purpose for you. And sit back and relax and enjoy a bit of chit chat about the many projects that I've started and not finished this time around. So today I'll start off with what I am wearing. So this is a project that I tend to forget about a lot or I think that I don't like it as much and then when I put it on I remember that it's actually fine. Um, and this is the Ravelston by Isolde. And I'll stand up and come a bit closer so you can get a bit more of a picture of it. Quite hard to show. This is a really good basic pattern and this is the second version that I've knitted of it. Um, I finished this probably a good few years ago. It has options to make either a classic kind of round neck crew neck jumper or a v-neck like this. It also has options for the hem to be a folded hem or a ribbed hem. I modified this pattern to be worked with stripes of a mohair and a fingering weight yarn. So if I put my arm up closer you can kind of see the difference in texture. And that was just something I added in on my own. I think I had seen the Elton pattern by Hovi Locatelli um, had come out around the same time, but I hadn't seen a striped mohair and fingering pullover, so I just kind of made it up on my own. I actually like how it turned out quite a lot. I think the main reason I don't wear it is because I don't love having to wear like a tank top underneath my um, sweaters and obviously since there's a few kind of more sheer bits um, this isn't particularly suitable for wearing to work if I don't have a tank top on underneath so that's one of the reasons and I think I have it in my head that it's more itchy than it actually is but I've put it on today and it's not particularly itchy I think maybe at the end of a full day of wearing it I can start to feel the mohair a bit but it's not particularly bad the yarn, this is um, Rowan Kid Silk Mohair, and a yarn on the house, fingering weight, I'll have to, I'll add in the actual, like, specific yarn that it was. Um, but it's quite a nice, soft, four-ply yarn. The reason I, uh, another reason that I ended up making it striped like this is because I only had a limited amount of the yarn of the house, the, the main four-ply, and so I was trying to figure out what I could actually um make out of a limited amount that I would actually wear. Not sure if I've been successful in the actually wearing it part but I did end up using the uh quantity that I had. Another reason is I'm not entirely certain that I love the fit of this. The pattern has the option to work shaping particularly like waist shaping and bust darts and this does actually have if you look closely there's some short row shaping added in around the bust. You can see it there because there's some stripes that disappear. Um, I don't mind that part, but I don't love necessarily the waist shaping and I think in hindsight I would also not do the folded hem with this particular yarn combination. I just don't love, it seems to kind of flare out at the bottom, which I don't love. So I would probably just work it straight down in future. So yeah, that kind of all adds up to be a reason that I don't wear it all the time. But now that I have it on, like I definitely could wear it more often. There's nothing really wrong with it at all. Like it's perfectly wearable, it's maybe not like my favorite, but I've made it, I should at least wear it. <laughs> this pattern is worked from the bottom up so I can't very easily go back and fix the hem. I mean it would be doable, uh, the stitches would be slightly offset obviously because it would be worked in the opposite direction. I'm not sure that it bothers me enough to actually go and do that. Um, but yeah, it is worked bottom up in the round and then yeah back and forth obviously for the back and the front yokes and then the sleeves are picked up and worked down. 
it's a very well written pattern i have nothing but good things to say about isola's patterns she writes a lot of good like classic pieces that are designed to fit really well i appreciate that it's not just always a raglan there's some different kind of more set in sleeves available as well so yeah that is what i'm wearing today so next up i do actually have a couple of finished objects the first is a hat and i think i have shown this a couple times on the show before this is the ponderosa hat by wool and pine and it is knit in some yarn that i picked up in milan i will put the details down below because it's unlikely to be a yarn that most people will seek out or find locally it was a very specifically um, like local yarn that I picked up and this is actually a hat that I made for my partner so I got this yarn as well as two other colors kind of a, a pinky color and a cream um, and then he picked out the blue and as I've said before I like to pick up yarn when I go on holiday so that I can make a souvenir that reminds me of the place that I visited and so what I ended up making for him is this Ponderosa hat and it's a very good classic cabled hat pattern um, I actually really like how it fits. I would maybe make it one repeat longer if I wanted like a more slouchy fitting hat. Um, but let me hold it up here. You could obviously unroll the brim if you wanted. I don't have tons to say about this to be honest. I mean I followed the pattern and the pattern worked. Um, it, it's a well-written pattern. I don't think it's overly difficult, although the cables are like a three over two cross, but if you've done cables, or even if you haven't done cables, I would say it's like not too bad as far as a beginner pattern goes. Yeah, I think it'll be really cozy in the winter. It's obviously not like really hat season now, but I'm sure it's, you know, Scotland, <laughs> it'll be hat season soon enough. Um, this has worked on, I believe, size 8 needles, so it actually, if I had focused my time on it, works up pretty quickly. And yeah, really nice and cozy. Love the bobble on top. Just a great classic cabled hat. The next project that I have finished is one that definitely hasn't made an appearance on this show yet, and it is another hat, but it's a baby hat. So this is the baby bear hat. It's a pattern by Knitting for Olive. I don't know if that's like if the shape is coming through but it's got these little kind of bear ears and it's got um, i-cord strings that you obviously can tie at the bottom of the baby's head there's what it looks like from the side it's very hard to model without actually having a child <laughs> here to show it off um it was a really interesting construction actually um you cast on at the front and work uh for a certain amount work back and forth back and forth and then you have um increases to make the ears and then as you're getting towards the back then you have um these stitches on the side here are on go on hold for a bit and then you're working back and forth and slowly decreasing these side stitches away hopefully that makes sense so yeah it made a lot of sense once i actually like knitting the, pa the pattern is written well it makes sense so yeah i think this is kind of like a sock in the sense that if you just follow the pattern it will appear <laughs> even if it doesn't necessarily seem like it makes sense when you read the pattern through but yeah it's a really good pattern really cute i used sheep she sheep juice stone washed 78 percent cotton 22 percent acrylic in the shade boulder opal and that is because I'm not 100% comfortable with making something in wool when I don't know that the parent wants to like hand wash or um, kind of baby whatever the item is and also there's always a concern that the kid might have you know issues with wool so it just seems safer to use a cotton acrylic blend. This is the I think roughly six month old size and that's because the baby's going to be born in July when they probably won't be needing this so hopefully it should fit them by the time winter comes around. So yeah that is the uh, baby bear hat by Knitting for Olive. The last finished object that I have is a basket and this is the scrap yarn basket by Cynthia Gonzalez and it's a free pattern. This is actually crochet as you can probably tell 
and it's fairly basic if you can crochet at all like I'm not a great crocheter but if you can crochet at all you can probably do this so it starts from the bottom and you work in a circle and you increase outward and then you start crocheting up and I think it's just single crochet from what I remember around and around and around and then you do the handles and the main purpose for me making this is that I wanted to use up a lot of this super chunky yarn. I had some in my stash when I thought I wanted to make hats out of it. Quickly became unenthralled with that idea. Um, it's kind of hard on your hands, I find, to work with that thick of yarn. And so I just had a bit that I wanted to use up. And so this is what I ended up making. Because I figured you can never have too many baskets. And what I've actually ended up using it for is for putting laundry in. Um, like the stuff that needs to be either hand washed or is delicate or whatever. So it's great. It just sits beside my normal laundry basket. Yeah, it's not the most beautiful thing in the world, but um, it's very functional and used up scraps. So what more can you ask for? So yeah, that is my third finished object. So now on to works in progress. And I will have mentioned this on the last episode, but I've made some pretty good progress since then. And this is the Gibby Shawl by Gladys Amedro, which is a pattern put out by Jameson and Smith. And I'm using Jameson and Smith one ply cobweb yarn as well. And this is a traditional style Shetland shawl. So it's going to be a big square and you work from the outside in. So when I last showed you my progress, I had been working on the edging, which works back and forth this way. And you, so you do the entire edging and then you pick up stitches from the edge of the edging, <laughs> if that makes sense, and start working in the way. So I finished the edging since I last recorded and I also have picked up all the stitches and started working, started working on the next part. So it'll be quite hard to see any sort of pattern so far, there's not much to see as well. Um, but I do find this way easier or less boring for sure than the edging. The edging was not technically difficult, but it was only uh, maybe 16 stitches at most. So it's just really short rows and you had to pay attention all the time at what you were doing. And it just, you couldn't feel it. I felt like I couldn't really get in a flow because it's such a short row and you have to turn and switch your hands and whatever. Whereas this is like 700 plus stitches in a row but it just means you can go and go and go and then you only need to check which uh, next row of the chart is not very often. So I think this is a lot better. And every other row of this is purled, which I know a lot of you are gonna be like, oh, that much purling, horrible. And that is because it, this is basically a garter stitch shawl, but when it's all stretched out, it, it looks less garter stitchy because I was slightly confused by that when I actually realized that it is and complete garter stitch because the finished pattern photos don't necessarily look like a lot of garter stitch but if you look closely hopefully you can see there's one kind of little flower shape um showing up there just here and then also you can see like it's garter stitch so hopefully that's showing up and if not I'll put up a picture anyways and I'll also include a picture of what the edging looked like before I actually started pick, before I actually picked everything up I had it laid out in a square to kind of visualize the size of it it's actually gonna be massive you can't really tell since it's all squished up on the needles at the moment it just looks like this really frilly lace thing and um, but yeah it'll be quite big so yeah, I feel like I'm pretty much in a flow with this at the moment. As I say, every other row is purled, so I mean, that makes it quite straightforward. And then the actual lace is not overly difficult. The pattern so far has been pretty easy to memorize, um, but future, future rows might be a bit trickier. Um, yeah, so making good progress. I have calculated out how much I need to finish like each day to have it done by the deadline. The deadline's not until September, so I'm not overly stressed about it. I basically need to do about one and a quarter rows every day, which is very doable. And obviously the further along I get, the um, 
shorter the rows will get, which is a nice bonus. So as I get closer to the end, it'll be even easier to do uh, more and more rows in a day. So making good progress, much happier with it now that the edging is done because that was boring and tedious and I felt like I couldn't, I had to pay such close attention. <laughs> but yeah, it, I'm making good progress now. The next project is something I mentioned on my uh, video about lessons from my first year of spinning, but I don't think I've talked about it on a normal podcast episode yet. And it's also one that I actually mentioned in my 10 accessories that I want to make um, video. So yeah, I'm actually doing one of those accessories. <laughs> Yay. And that is the Cinnabar shawl. So here's where I'm at so far. And the Cinnabar shawl is worked in, it's an asymmetrical triangle and it is worked in brioche and garter. So here's the brioche part and then the garter side over here. I'm really happy with how it's turning out so far. This is using some of my hand spun that's left over from my metamorphic sweater. And that was from an art bat from Ceiling Wheelie, which I feel like I've mentioned like every single episode, but that's fine. <laughs> and the other, um, the gray is also a hand spun. And this is actually using some of the blue face luster bat that I picked up at the Scottish Wool Producers Showcase. And I showed a little bit of this on my last episode, but I'll talk about it briefly. So I ended up having some grays and black and a little bit of blue in my stash and I knew for this color I didn't want to use pure white or cream as my contrast color but I knew I wanted to make this pattern with this yarn and I was kind of visualizing a gray so when I had that uh, BFL I pulled out some of the other colored fiber that I had in my stash and I started to blend it. And I blended it using my drum carter. I just have a small drum carter, about five inches wide or so. And I blended the BFL with those grays and I've made these lovely little bats. Um, so you can see it's a bit heathered. Um, but it's just a nice kind of mid gray. And I didn't actually have to use tons and tons of the other colored fibers uh, to make the white not white. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I spun up my first skein of that. I'm obviously nearly done with it, so I need to start spinning the other ones. These are a few of the little nests of fiber that I have to spin still, and I've got a few more downstairs. Um, it works up pretty quickly, or spins up pretty quickly. I'm spinning it um woolen so there's some nice air in there i'm not really worried about the consistency too much because there were a lot of neps in the original bat the bfl bat so it's making quite a textured yarn which you can see in some spots in this you can see this white bit sticking out here and a little bit there as well but that's all right because this is not the most consistent yarn in the world either so it's kind of very much a more rustic-y version of this shawl, which I, I don't really mind. Um, I mostly, I don't know, this might be more of a process knit than a product knit. Like, I'll, I will wear it, but I'm mostly just enjoying watching the colors and how they work up. So yeah, that is my current progress on the Cinnabar shawl. I would definitely recommend this pattern. Um, I think it's a fairly reasonable introduction to brioche. Obviously, you have increases. So you, to make this asymmetrical triangle, you increase um, on the first and last stitches of each section. So you here and here, and then here and here, but the brioche increases add two per row, per, per row that you increase, two there and two here, whereas the garter stitch sections only add one stitch per, one, one, add one here and one here. So that's how you get the asymmetrical triangle. And you start here with a garter tab right here and then kind of work back and forth like this. So yes, that is the Cinnabar shawl. Really happy with it so far. 
Those are probably the two projects that I've been working on the most. The Gibby Shawl, just because I do have a deadline, like granted it's in September, but I want to make sure I'm not feeling rushed at the end and have plenty of time to block it and make it look, you know, really nice because it is for a wedding, even if it's not like... She might not be wearing it like for much of the wedding, but I just want it to look nice for the day. And then the cinema shawl, just because I'm enjoying watching the colors work up. It's a fun project and I like working with my hands fun. So the next project that I've been working on, I've been kind of going, well, no, I haven't cast on too many things. I want to cast on a lot of things. I've been fairly restrained and I've only cast on one or two things. So this is the next project that I've started and this is the Argyll by Claire Lakewood. And this is going to actually be my first kind of summary project that I've ever worked on. I don't know why, it just hasn't particularly appealed to me in the past um, kind of summer type projects, but I'm finding myself more and more interested in them lately and that might be partly because I'm watching more and more people on YouTube and stuff make really interesting summery spring projects. So yeah, this is going to be my version and this is going to be a heavily modified version of the Argyll. So this is a pattern I think first appeared in a pom-pom magazine and it is a tank top and uh, the original pattern is meant to it's kind of um a camisole with it's meant to have a tie in the front i don't particularly like wearing like having ties on my clothing i find it quite bulky and like right on my stomach i don't know it's just not something i enjoy and i also didn't really want the garter bumps on this particular pattern because I don't know. I like garter stitch in certain times and places, but I didn't really love how it was turning out on this pattern. So I'm not doing the tie and I'm not doing garter bumps. Um, and this is where I'm at so far. I'm not far along at all. Um, and it's going to be quite a low contrast stripe situation. So there's a, a light gray and kind of a pale blue. And the light gray is the fiber company meadow in the color bed straw and i would say this is a light fingering or a heavy lace weight i used it for a lace shawl that i made for my partner's grandmother um it was a wild swan shawl but i ended up having plenty of yarn left over and so this is a 40 percent merino 25 percent llama 20 percent silk and 15 percent linen so it's quite an interesting combination it's a really nice gray. I like gray. <laughs> I think with those col uh, that um, combination of fibers, it shouldn't be overly warm. I, like I guess probably 65% is fairly warm, but then silk and linen can be quite cooling. And it's a fairly um, airy fabric as well as a lightweight yarn and it's going to be a tank top. And also I live in Scotland, so you know, I'm not overly worried about overheating. <laughs> So that is the main color I'm using. And then the contrast color is the Border Mill Alpaca Rose 4-ply. And this is in the shared shade Laramar, Laramar, I'm not sure which. And um, this is 50% alpaca and 50% rose. And rose fiber is kind of one of these manufactured fibers, kind of like bamboo um, or like kind of a rayon. I'm not entirely certain of the process behind it, but I know it's something that's it's not man-made because it is derived from like a rose plant, but it does take quite a lot of processing behind the scenes. So it's man-made-ish, but it also will will like compost if you put it in, in a compost bin. Um, so I think kind of like tinsel, rayon, that kind of thing. I don't know enough about um, man-made fibers like this or I don't know, processed plant fibers to really be speak with authority on it, but it's something along those lines. Um, this is obviously quite a drapey yarn as well, and it's very, very soft. I'm not entirely certain if that's the alpaca and the rose, if it's both. But anyways, I think the rose will be quite, would be quite a lightweight, like good summer fiber as well. And the alpaca, you know, it can be quite warm, but I think again, with the weight at which this is knit, it will not be over, overly warm. And again, it's a tank top. Um, the main reason I chose this is because it suited the quantities that I had. So these are both yarns that I had in stash. I bought this last year at the, oh no, maybe a couple years ago at the Glasgow School of Yarn Festival. Um, and I originally bought it because 
I really loved it but I didn't want to buy too much so I bought I think a quantity for like a cowl but I've decided to have enough cowls right now and I prefer a slightly bigger one so I didn't think I have two skeins of it I didn't think that I would have enough to really make the size I wanted and I prefer a cowl that will also stand up a bit and this is quite drapey obviously <laughs> it just flops right over so I kind of just had it sitting there in stash didn't really know what to do with it and then I decided it went really well with this and I actually saw this pattern I think I first saw it maybe on Venetia or the Wooly Workers podcast and yeah I did the, it just when I was looking through Ravelry at what options I had for the amount of yarn that I had this is a pattern that came up so you start from the back and you work the back upwards I believe and then then you pick up on the sides and work sideways I think and then you work the top I'm not entirely sure if that's correct I just know it's a very different kind of construction which is another thing that drew me in so yes would definitely suggest looking into this pattern if you like kind of uniquely constructed items and I will keep you updated on how it's going and if I run out of yarn <laughs> I've also decided to adjust the stripe ratio slightly so it's supposed to be six rows of the main color to two rows of the contrast color um but because I have more of the contrast color than the pattern calls for and either spot on or slightly less than the pattern calls for for the main um I'm trying to increase the contrast color I use I'm also I didn't get gauge but I didn't really want to go up a needle size because I like the fabric that this is giving me so far and I thought it would be too kind of stretched out looking if I went up anymore so I decided to knit the size six and I think I would normally be knitting the size four they have a ton of sizes in this pattern I think there's 12 or 15 something along those lines um because there's not actually that many inches or centimeters in between each size to really give it the best um, possible fit so yes I am working a little bit up from what I normally would be and I calculated that out based on yeah based on what my gauge is versus what the pattern gauge is um, a size six is the one that should give me the correct size that I'm looking for so yes that is our girl sweater by Claire Lakewood all right so I do have other works in progress that have been started but not really worked on recently so I'm not going to bother mentioning them too much. I'm still working on some vanilla socks and I still have my Lucia or Lucia um, sweater but they're kind of on hold at the moment or just being worked on as and when so there's not really much to update about those so I won't bore you <laughs> with those details. Now I do have some spinning to talk about so I finally have a finished object. This is some sock yarn and this is a that rainbow sock fiber that I've been working on for I think it was like 50 odd days and I was spinning this on my drop spindle and this fiber is from Hilltop Cloud and it is 70% Sheviot wool, 15% bio nylon and 15% silk and it's a mirrored gradient so I will kind of try and show you what it looks like It's a really lovely rainbow. I ended up doing a chain ply, which is, um, so I spun it all end to end on my drop spindle and then I chain plied it, which resulted in a three ply sock yarn. I think it's probably on the heavy side. It's maybe verging towards a heavyweight sock yarn or even a sport, but I'm still gonna make socks out of it and they might just be slightly thicker socks. I ended up plying it on my wheel because I was not going to ply this on a drop spindle because that is just too many things to keep track of and yeah I don't I, I just won't do that. <laughs> I do I think what I've learned from this from working with my drop spindle so much is that it will never replace my wheel but I do appreciate the portability of it and that it makes it a possibility for me to spin if I go to like guild meetings or if I'm going to travel or go on holiday I have the option to take my drop spindle if I want something else to work on that's not just knitting because my wheel isn't particularly portable and I only am going to work on my wheel at home. So that is the only finished spinning project that I have. The next thing I have to show you is a little bit of progress on a Rambouillet spin. So this is 
Bobbin. And this is um, again from Hilltop Cloud and it's a purple Rambouillet. Here's the fiber. So it's just a lovely tonal purple. And this is intended to go with this other skein that I had finished from, I think maybe I finished it last episode, I don't know. So there's obviously hits of purple in here, which go really nicely with this. And the intention is to give it to the lady I bought my, spin, my spinning wheel from, just as kind of a thank you. And yeah, I know she, she knits and stuff, and I don't think she ever spun very much. So yes, that is the progress there. I also got a new flyer, which is the part, um, if you don't know about spinning, it's the part that spins holds the bobbin and also spins the yarn around the bobbin if that makes sense. It's kind of hard to explain but I might put a video in but anyways I got a flyer that now has different speeds because my wheel only has my original wheel and, and the flyer it has was from right about the 1970s only had one speed on it which was generally fine but it just gives you more options if you have more speeds available. You can a ply more quickly and B, just spin your singles more quickly. So this definitely spun up much faster than, well, not much faster. It definitely spun up faster than my previous flyer. So that's very exciting. It's just going to make projects go a bit quicker when I want them to. Not every project obviously needs to go quicker, but it's nice to have the option. So that is progress there. So that's my first bobbin done. And I've got about twice this left to spin. I might be able to get it done today. We'll see where I get to. Now this is kind of leading into some acquisitions, but at my most recent guild meeting, I actually ended up picking up some fleece. Yeah, so five or six of us had arranged to get these fleeces from a lady who had got in touch. Her, I think, brother is a vet and had been raising these sheep. So I got a Chirino, which, or I went in on two of the three fleeces, um, and I got about 300 grams of each. One was a Chirino, which is a Charlet and Merino cross, and I haven't done much with that yet. And then the other is a Hampshire Down cross with a Polworth Romney, which I think was an accidental cross. I think a ram got in where he wasn't meant to, and this is the result. But this is what one lock looks like. So it's probably about, I don't know, three or four inches when it's properly stretched out. And you can see how springy it is, which I think is part, I think is part of the Hampshire Down characteristics. I think it's quite a springy elastic wool. And yeah, it's washed up really nicely. Um, I used the Unicorn Power Scour to wash this and it's done exactly what it needs to. Um, it's got all the lanolin out, it's not greasy, so that's a success. And then what I've been doing with these washed locks is just flicking open the tips and the butts. So it just makes them, if there's any kind of I don't know, dirty bits or kind of clumpy bits just from being outside and getting in amongst the mud and the rain and whatnot. It um, flicks them out, makes them clean, gets any trap dirt out, and the same with the butts where they've been cut. They can kind of clump together there. And so I've done that here as well. My intention with these, I believe, well, I don't know for certain, but I think my current plan is to save up and buy some wool combs because this fiber is certainly long enough that you could comb it and make your own hand comb top and I think that would be a really lovely use of it. I could also put it on my drum carter but I don't know it seems a waste to do all that like flicking open of the tips and then uh, not comb it out and make something really nice. So I don't have any like ultimate plans of what project it would be but that is my thoughts on how I might end up processing it. All right, so last but not least, I'll talk a little bit about an acquisition. And there's just the one, um, and it is this cone of yarn. And I have fallen down the woolly knit <laughs> yarn to cone uh, wormhole. This is the 100% merino wool in the color um, Tierra Beige Nep. So it's this Tweety Beige. And the plan for this is to make my boyfriend a cardigan. Um, this was a request he had made that he quite fancies a cardigan. And my current plan is to make the Longfellow cardigan, which is a pattern by Michelle Wang for Brooklyn Tweed. Brooklyn Tweed is definitely one of my go-tos when I'm looking for patterns that work for men. 
they have a lot of really classic looking items and this one is actually um could be knit for a man or a woman there are pictures um of both men and women modeling this on the pattern page so that's always nice because a lot of the times you see patterns that are supposedly like able to knit for men but you then don't see any actual pictures of anyone who's knit it for a man and it's just hard to kind of visualize sometimes at least for me what that might look like on um a straighter body um so yeah that is the plan for this quite exciting i don't know when i'm going to start it it's a um i haven't swatched or anything but it is here when i'm ready <laughs> um and i think the pattern looks fairly straightforward it's all knit in pieces and then seamed which i don't particularly have a problem with it can be actually a lot more portable of a project if you knit things that way um it's easier to carry about and you don't have to carry an entire sweater about with you um once you get more of it done so that's the plans for this the um only other acquisition which is kind of not fully an acquisition but i'll mention it anyways is this which is ply magazine and it's a magazine for hand spinners uh, this is the first copy i've actually ever had and i got a, a year's worth of of us or a year's subscription from my grandma for Christmas and this was the first um, issue that that subscription covers. So this one is actually this is the science issue so there's a lot in here about those man-made fibers. Well not man-made but you know kind of processed fibers non-natural fibers I don't know. Um, so it includes things like sea cell, pearl, tensile, rose, and mint. So I should probably read this and figure out all, uh, all about what's in my rose alpaca yarn. Um, as well as a lot of different, a lot of things about um, ratios, technical yarn descriptions, science of shedding sheep, regenerated fibers. I'm really looking forward to having a good read of this and learning more about hand spinning. Um, lastly, I thought I would mention, start mentioning some podcasts that I enjoy. Um, and so I'll kick that off by mentioning Mel Makes Stuff. She is a really interesting, uh, has a really interesting channel, always really interesting videos. It's not always on a super regular basis because obviously she's like, has a real, a full-time job and the podcast is just for her own enjoyment. It isn't like her job. Um, but when she does put out a video, it is definitely worth watching. So she just put one out that has some uh, particular projects that she's been working on. I guess they're not hugely unusual techniques, but I just enjoy the way that she explains her thinking and the thought that goes into every project. There's a lot of detail and she goes a lot into the why and what what made her choose particular colors or what made her um, make any particular modifications to a pattern. And she's very good at explaining those things. So that is my podcast recommendation uh, for this episode, um, and that's Mel Makes Stuff. Something else, so another example of something she's gone kind of on a deep dive, she go, she'll go into deep dives on particular topics, so I think she's got an episode or a few different episodes all about Fair Isle or stranded, stranded knitting, color work knitting. She had one recently about Japanese knitting patterns, which I knew nothing about, and that was fascinating. So highly recommend going and checking her channel out. Finally, I have the winner for the giveaway from my last episode. So I did a random comment picker and I've got the screenshot here and the winner is Linda Williamson. So thanks to everyone who commented and left me um, descriptions of your favorite yarn buying experience. It was so interesting and so nice to read about all the different maybe yarn stores or festivals that you've been to and enjoyed over the years. Um, and I really appreciate everyone who participated. But Linda, get in touch with me. Just message me on YouTube or um, on Ravelry or on Instagram. And I will arrange to send your skin of yarn and the project bag to you. So thanks again to everyone who participated. So I think that is all I have for this episode. It has been um, great to chat with you all again. I hope it's been interesting and not too chaotic. Um, I feel like I have a lot of things on the go at the moment and uh, not necessarily tons of product to show for it, but you know, that's that's how my crafting is, so you see it all. As always, if you have any questions or comments, uh, feel free to let me know down below, or what, I'd love to know what you were working on while you were watching this, um, or if there's anything that I'm working on that you've also made. 
it's always a lot of fun to hear from you so I always appreciate it when I do get a comment through. All right everyone that's all from me. I hope you are all well, staying safe, and I will see you on the next video. Happy knitting! Bye!